66 million years ago, a meteor larger than Mount Everest smashed into our planet, carving an enormous crater into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Forests burned for thousands of miles, earthquakes rippled across the Earth's crust, and tsunamis drowned the coasts. Then dust clouds covered the sun, leaving our planet cold and barren. Life on Earth would never be the same again. It wasn't just the dinosaurs that got murked by the meteor. The aftermath devastated sea life, ended the pterosaurs, and killed off pretty much anything larger than a medium-sized dog. Except me. Oh right, yeah, except crocodiles. The best place to be when the meteor hit was here, on the complete opposite side of the Earth. Stands to reason, right? While no one is safe when the plants stop photosynthesizing, the closer you were to the impact site, the closer you were to the fire, dust, and devastation. But, a few months ago, researchers studying a group of animals currently living in Central and North America worked out that they have been there the whole time. They evolved long before the end of the Cretaceous period, which means they were living in and around the region the meteor hit, when the meteor hit it. These are the only ground zero survivors known to science. So who were they? And how did they ride out this extinction event in style from the edges of a blast zone? Well, the first question at least has an easy answer. It's a family called Xanthusidae, commonly known as night lizards. To me, that name conjures up something sleek, black, and dangerous. But this 34-strong group of skink-related reptiles is pretty plain, and they're only a threat if you're a termite or scorpion. Half the night lizards aren't even nocturnal. They got this name because they're so good at avoiding attention, people assumed they only came out at night. In fact, they simply hate leaving the house, occupying rocky crevices or rotten logs, with some spending their entire lives under one single patch of cover. By studying the genetics and morphology of living night lizards, and looking back at the fossil record, scientists figured out they have their origins in the mid-Cretaceous, and that they had already split into two lineages at this point. One that would go on to give rise to 33 of the modern-day night lizards, and one that would form the remaining one, the poor, lonely Cuban night lizard Cricosaura. Both groups, wait, is it right to call the Cuban night lizard a group? Anyway, both made it through unscathed. And this is odd because while night lizards have some traits that would have made them good survival machines, in many ways they're the complete opposite of what we'd expect. In the plus column, they have slow metabolisms, meaning they can go long periods without a meal. This would obviously be helpful when food became harder to find, and it's a feature shared by many other famous survivors like crocodiles and turtles. They're also very small, like the mammals and birds that won big once the dinosaurs cashed in their chips. The smallest night lizards are 4 centimeters long, and even the larger Channel Island species that have experienced island gigantism are no more than 10 centimeters. Being small is a good thing during an extinction event, because it means you use fewer resources, have higher population sizes, and can usually reproduce quickly and in large numbers. Whereas our selection, investing a lot of resources into a low number of offspring, can work well when conditions are stable, it's a bad bet during disasters. When even the best prepared child may not have much hope of survival, it's better to play the numbers game. Here's the thing though, night lizards don't follow the trend. They have just one or two young at a time, and that seems to have been pretty consistent throughout their entire history. Some of the larger island species managed to push the boat out to litters as large as five or six, but this relative fecundity was probably a later development that came when they grew in size. Interestingly, while Cuban night lizards lay eggs like most reptiles, all the rest give birth to live young, but the Cuban night lizard also lays just a single egg at a time. Having small numbers of babies seems more crucial to the night lizard's strategy than whether or not to lay eggs at all, and by rights, this should have doomed them. Another important survival trait is not being too fussy. Specialists that need very specific conditions or food sources do poorly during times of crisis. It's the generalists that can live anywhere and eat anything that cling on through extinctions. But the night lizards are microhabitat specialists. Some only live in yucca or agave plants, others in the crevices formed by exfoliating granite, and others demand decaying logs in a wet and wooded environment. This is why their modern distribution is so scattered and disjointed. Perhaps 65 million years ago, the night lizards were less picky, but the scientists who wrote this paper think they still would have had very narrow ranges, and having a large geographic range is one of the best buffers against going extinct that an animal can have. So what's going on here? The night lizards survived the mass extinction despite only living in small patches of the worst affected regions and only having one or two offspring at a time. Did they just get lucky? 
Are we lacking some important context about the traits that make animals better at surviving extinctions? Are they just meteor proof? Or could there be some other explanation? I think we need to take a closer look at these secretive reptiles and figure out exactly what they are hiding. <laughs>